Welcome to the Being Blackbeard Podcast, the show for pirate geeks and TV fans about the show Crossbones. Here are your hosts, Bill Johnson, Tony D'Amco, and Richard Dryling. All right, turn it up, swashbucklers. You are listening to the Being Blackbeard Podcast. I'm your host, Phil Johnson, and with me tonight is my co-host, Tony D'Amco. Ahoy. And here we are. Uh, we're uh, we're not sure where Richard Dryling is tonight, but uh, he may pop in uh, somewhere during this episode. We're actually recording this. It's after midnight. Usually we record this on Sunday. It is technically now Monday morning uh, because my gig <laughs> ran super late tonight. But anyway, uh, we are. Uh, this is episode seven of our podcast, but we are uh, discussing episode six of the NBC show Crossbones starring John Malkovich. And uh, and we've got something special for you tonight, too, because we also did an interview with Ezra Buzzington uh, that we recorded the other night, who plays Oswald Eisengrim on the show. And it is a super cool interview, and you guys are going to totally dig it. And uh, But before we go there, we have got to discuss episode six of Crossbones, which is called A Hole in the Head. And uh, my, my response, all the way through the show, I was going, holy hell, there's all sorts of crap going on in this show. It was a, a seriously cool uh, episode. I, I have to agree. This is arguably the best episode out of the whole series. Uh, I love the beginning of the series. Uh, I thought it kind of slowed down a little bit in the midway point, uh, but the last few episodes have been great, and this one in particular, uh, like I said, I think it's the best episode of the whole series so far. Uh, but the, the back and forth between Lowell and uh, Blackbeard, uh, the whole operation... Uh, the whole dynamic of the island itself and the blend of uh, what's been going on with all the different characters on this ensemble series. Uh, just five stars. Cannot give it a, a better review. Yeah, this one, it really seemed like they, they punched the gas on this one. And uh, it, it it seems like we're, you know, we're fast forwarding to the brick wall of whatever happens in episode 10. Um. <laughs> no, uh, absolutely. I really feel like at some point... In the production of this series, they just feel like they – this is what I've been waiting for, for them to just sort of go balls to the wall and just say, look, look, we don't know how long this is going to last. We've got this money from NBC. Let's just go all out, and <laughs> this is the episode I've been waiting for. They just push it so much harder, not with – again, not just with the Lowell uh, Blackbeard relationship, but everybody on the show and on the island – they just took it to that next level that I've been waiting for, and it was just absolutely fantastic. Yeah, so right right from the beginning, they go over the top with the... Uh, I, 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 this one had a lot of reveals. Right from the top, they, uh, they give us a, a little bit of dish on Antoinette, because she's still being... Uh, Jagger is still uh, interrogating her, and he goes, oh, we mm -hmm. found your husband. Now, I was like, all right, so now we know husband, but is she really... Blackbeard's wife at some point or is she just delusional and she's like a stalker but Jagger is playing into that story in her head to get the connection there's that uh, there's that inference uh, between the the back and forth between uh, Jagger and uh, Antoinette the, the first 10 minutes of the episode goes into Antoinette and like you said her issues of what is real and what is delusional uh, there's references to a child being born so we don't know uh, as far as uh, Blackbeard's flashbacks or what his visions. Is it Antoinette? Is it his child? Uh, there also seems to be a reference, and maybe this is just me. We can disagree about this or go from there. Uh, when she talks about, it, especially the, the line she keeps reciting, especially at the end, the gift I gave is the gift I take back. Right. It, maybe Maybe this is just me, but it makes it sound like they had a child and she killed it. Oh, that could be. Yeah, I hadn't really thought of it that way. I mean, that's obviously a, a line that means something, uh, you know, because they, they really pushed it out there and she repeats it. And so, OK, we're supposed to guess about whatever it means. Um, yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I guess it could be the baby. I hadn't really uh, thought about it on that angle. I just kind of wrote it down and went, oh, OK, I don't know what that means. I'll wait and find out. Um, but that, uh, the, yeah, that makes sense that it could be the baby and we've seen, cause she's holding the baby at the end of the episode, but she, I think we've seen that baby before. Have we not? Uh, we've, we've seen it, I think in, uh, Blackbeard's flashbacks or not necessarily flashbacks, but the, the visions that he gets, uh, 
again, that was just my initial take from the episode, or at least the, uh, especially the last scene in regards to Antoinette and what was going on. I'm curious to hear what you had to, what was your uh, take from those scenes and uh, especially the very end clip? And we'll get back to the stuff in the middle of the episode, but let's get to that. <laughs> but let's do the end first. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I uh, I don't I don't you know honestly I don't know if I thought it through uh, about what the the particular gift would be I think I just I just kind of wrote it down in my notebook and went oh okay well we'll find out about that later and uh, uh, I, I I'm I when I watch a show I just go ah, I don't know what that means they'll probably tell me later I don't like to work that hard. <laughs> I like to just wait until they tell me what it means. So yeah, I definitely think it. I think I think it could be the baby. Well, obviously, you were never raised Catholic because Catholics totally overanalyze everything that goes <laughs> on in uh, television, life, thoughts, songs. So okay, I am a uh, I'm a completely that's... lapsed Catholic, so I've given all of it up, even that. Yes. <laughs> But um, well, that explains why you're so happy. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, we I, we didn't even see why uh, why she has the bleeding eyes is because she keeps scratching her own eyes out, which I thought was an interesting little tidbit. Uh, I think that's just a natural uh, thing that happens around people who are around Julian stands. I think that guy <laughs> is so evil that it just. We should have asked uh, Ezra that. Do you scratch your own eyes when you're around Julian Sands? Because that just seems like something you would do. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be a whole new, oh, my God, there's Julian Sands. <laughs> <laughs> it would be horrible. It's eyelid ripping time when Julian Sands shows up. <laughs> Yeah, so I thought uh, the whole Antoinette thing, you know, what I want to, I mean, the the thing that we're really waiting to find out is how does she get into Blackbeard's head? Because they're, uh, uh, it's, it's, because at first, okay, hallucinations, obviously not a hallucination. So how, are they going to pull in some sort of uh, a witchcraft angle or something like that? Because that we haven't really touched on at all. You know, maybe, maybe it's no longer, especially in the references that they made to this episode, that it's no longer about him having mental issues or disease or something in his head. Maybe really it is. It is all about, you know, it's funny that we were referencing Catholicism, but maybe really it is. It's all about guilt. Uh, it's just the sort of sins of your life coming back in to haunt you, uh, especially as you get older, as Blackbeard is. Maybe that's... I, I and I honestly I initially I initially never thought about this before until we just started talking about it. But maybe that's what the visions are all about. It's just life coming back to haunt you. And maybe the thing that Blackbeard is going through is not a, a mental problem or a psychological problem or a disease of the brain problem. Maybe it's just the guilt of life kind of catching up with you. And someone like Blackbeard's character, uh, with everything that he's been through in his life. These visions are nothing more than just really life catching up with you. Yeah, I definitely think so. What I want to find out is what's the because there's uh, she's getting into I don't well okay he doesn't know what's going on which makes me think there is a mechanical something happening where she is getting into his head because he doesn't know about he doesn't know who she is or he thinks he doesn't know who she is and and he doesn't know what's going on so somehow she's getting into his head and that's what i want to find out what that angle is how she's getting into his head uh sure it it could just be denial <laughs> which i'm very familiar with uh, I, I i am very curious to see where the last uh three episodes three or four episodes go to kind of bridge that gap yeah especially Considering that they don't know if they have a second season. Right. Um, I hope, and not that should be a factor in the creative process, but I really hope that I get some sort of closure out of this, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> I mean, we've bought into this series, uh, podcast aside, I want to know what this, where this story is going, and I hope um, either that they get picked up for another season or at least that we get to understand what this has all been leading up to because right not just only with Antoinette and uh and blackbeard but so many of the stories of the characters yeah uh on this island i, I like i look i've bought in for seven episodes i want closure <laughs> <laughs> 
yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting to see to see where they take that one and and how much they reveal about it or or don't reveal. So the other the other like major thing that kind of blew my mind was when we see Nena uh, cut Rose's throat and stuff her into a treasure box. <laughs> and honestly, I gotta say that might be the best. Other than the first five minutes of the series when the show starts off, that was the best moment of this entire series so far. Because yeah. I, I, I don't know about you, but I absolutely did not see that coming. And that's what I want from an ongoing series. I want my characters to surprise me. I want the storyteller to shock me. And that was a moment where I, I was able to see it Friday, so I recorded it, and I was actually watching it today. Uh-huh. And I, I rewound it like four or five different times. <laughs> Because I was like, is this really happening? Did I catch this uh, as it is? And th- 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 again, this is why I love the series and why I think this particular episode has been the best so far is because it had that moment that just absolutely grabbed me and surprised me and shocked me. And that's what I want from a TV series, uh, especially something like this. And I don't know, tell me your thoughts from when you saw that moment uh, as you were watching the show. Yeah, I thought it came as a real, uh, a real shock too. I mean, cause we had the setup where Rose is asking her for more money and, uh, and they, they kind of lean in the Leslie direction again and all that kind of stuff. And then, uh, and then, boom! She was just there, and just we're just gonna we're just gonna cut a bitch and stuff her into a treasure chest. And I was like, "Oh, all right, NBC, <laughs> you just uh, you go ahead and do that, then. All right, that's interesting." And yeah, I because it really just kind of came out of nowhere, and I fully didn't expect that. And uh, I thought it was uh, I thought it was a really interesting turn. Now they didn't. I mean, she goes into Rose's room to try and find the letter, right? Because Rose had said, "Oh, I, I left a letter that would implicate you." You know, if anything happens to me, but they didn't actually show her finding the letter. They just showed her hiding out and she was ready to to uh, cut that other chick that came in. And uh, but they, they didn't actually show her finding the letter. So we still don't know how that's going to play out. Uh, no, which is I think was a good t- uh, point of turn in the show, because you still have to keep buying into because now that Rose is gone. Uh, and again, I cannot emphasize how fast uh, how awesome that was. Not that I. <laughs> Not that I'm just enjoying it, like, oh, I want to see a chick cut a chick. But it was just so, it was so, because you really, even as questionable as uh, Nina's character is, you really were starting to get really, an- I, I don't know about you, but I was really starting to get annoyed by Rose and how she's blackmailing her and uh-huh. how yeah. she's just, just like manipulating and I want everything and I was like, wow, I really hate her at some point in this episode. And the fact that it was like right out, I was at the point that I hated her so much that she got killed. I was like, in the sense that you, you got the big payoff, but also figuring out, is she going to find the letter? And uh, it just gives more depth uh, depth to uh, Neem's character. Yeah, definitely. And I lost you a little bit in there, but I think I got the gist of it. Um Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I thought I and I don't think I don't think there's a backstory to I don't think there's a backstory that's going to redeem Rose in that in that plot. I think she was just out blackmailing her. No, absolutely, but you I, I think because of the whole letter reference and uh, the dream sequence or at least the flashbacks that she was having to references to the letter, it just still makes you want to ch- I don't want to say necessarily cheer for that character, but you are pulling for her, or you're at least engaged in, well, is she going to find the letter? And if she doesn't find the letter, is it going to get to Blackbeard? And what's going to happen with that? Right. Um, I just thought that was just a very nice touch on this episode that had so much else going for it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The, the It was just a, a, a good shock, a good sort of... Um... Uh, a good sort of Game of Thrones shock, like, here, we're going to knock off one of the main characters now. Not a main, main character, but, you know, one of the main cast. We're going to knock him off right here in episode six, you know, or seven, six, six. Yeah. <laughs> I've lost count now. Yeah, but it, the series kind of needed that because I, until she got killed, you were kind of thinking, like, is anybody going to die amongst all these pirates? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, other than... 
the guy who died, I think, in episode two or three, the other ship captain that they killed, um, you were kind of starting to think, like, you know, for all these violent guys, nothing's really happening. That's <laughs> true. It's like people getting killed. Um, and you need that for a series, especially a series like this that regards pirates, that there's got to be an element of danger, an element of you got to care for these characters because they could be lost at any moment. And that was one thing about this episode that I really loved. It, it kind of made you appreciate everybody else. Yeah, yeah. Even though Rose isn't a very well-liked character, um, you've got to put that element of danger in the surroundings to care for everybody. Yeah, and wouldn't you know it was the ladies that go to it first? Which is really true to life. Let's just be honest. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i mean they were really i mean the um the the amount of reveals in this one not i mean not necessarily reveals to the viewer but reveals to each other where low lays it all out with uh with uh with um uh kate and then blackbeard lays it all out with low uh after he kicks his ass uh, where he's like, ah, I kicked your ass, and guess what? I'm not going to Jamaica. Uh, that's not the plan at all. And all right, I still trust you to drill into my head. Yeah, you know, that's yeah, that's how that's what shows how great this episode was. That we're we've been talking about so many other things that we haven't gotten down to. Uh, Low revealing himself to Kate, and the whole black uh, Low revealing himself to Blackbeard element of this episode. That's how deep this episode was. Yeah. Because uh, first of all, let's go. Let's start with uh, Low revealing himself to Kate, which I just I just thought was just a f an absolutely fascinating, but also just a beautiful back and forth between them. I don't know how you took that scene, but that's the scene that actually made me really love Kate. Because I've been back and forth about her um, watching this entire series. I've liked the character, but I I haven't had that moment where I wanted to believe in her. Right. But that scene between Lowell and Kate was the moment I fell in love with Kate. And I, I just thought it was one of the best moments, uh, of not only of this episode, but of this entire series. Yeah. Well, I mean, she's been she's been hard to like because she's kind of flighty, you know. OK, now, as she, you know, she's devoted to her husband and then she's. Then she's kissing on low, and then she's devoted to her husband again. And then she's kissing on low, and I think that kind of uh, aspect makes you go, eh, "I don't, I don't know if I like her that much." But when she turns on him like that and spits in his face, and then they they duke it out, uh, yeah, that uh, you go, "Okay, well she she stands for something." Then exactly, that was the moment in the show that she actually sort of drew her line in the sand and said, "This is what I believe in," and yeah, if you turn away, I'm going to scream like this guy's a traitor. That was, again, she's been a, an interesting character and a good character, but you, you, at least I've been waiting for her moment to show me what she believes in and show me, show me, shows me what she stands for. And this episode gave you that moment. I think it's actually siding with her husband, too. I think she feels... Uh, um... I think she feels like she was lied to by Lowe, certainly, which which any woman isn't going to like. But I think she's also – it's sort of her, I'm going to side with my husband, too, because he does say, go back to England with me or go to Carolina with me and we'll be safe. And, and uh, you know, that's where she – she's not only drawing her line politically, she's drawing her drawing her line romantically, too, I think. Yeah, absolutely. She, uh, she has a certain loyalty to her husband, but she also has a certain loyalty to Blackbeard. And – even beyond loyalty, I like the fact that it was just her moment to say, this is what I believe in. Right. Even her loyalty to the people of the island and the other, not just the pirates, but the people who are surrounding there. Uh, and not just in a business sense, because as, as we pointed out, she is a quartermaster. Yes. Uh, <laughs> you guys will hear it in the interview later, <laughs> but we we were uh, corrected. <laughs> For being sexist, I get it. Uh, <laughs> but it, you just sort of get her what she believes in kind of moment. And that's what you want from a character. Uh, whether it's television, film, literature, you want to see what the people you're following believe in. And you get that moment 
And I think people who've been watching this series kind of get that moment from from Kate in this moment, uh, in this episode, of what she actually stands for. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it was great. Yeah, it was fantastic. It was really good. And then, uh, I, I, and I wasn't sure. I didn't think he killed her, but I was. I I wrote down knocked her out slash killed question mark because it uh, you really weren't sure if he you know because I mean he kind of put her in a sleeper hold but you didn't know if he choked her out entirely but it turns out yeah he just he knocked her out and so she'll be back uh, which is nice to see in that moment I kind of knew she was just choked out I knew he, they weren't going to kill her because they had already killed one character and on some levels I think it would have been fascinating if he actually did just straight out kill her because I would have taken the series to a whole new turn, but I kind of just knew that it was just like, oh, it's a sleeper hold. <laughs> right. <laughs> she tapped out. And yeah, I handed figured over too. the Intercontinental title, whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I figured. I figured it was too, but I, I kind of slashed it in my notebook just to see what would happen there. And then, uh, and then, so then uh, he goes and he outs himself to Blackbeard, at, where he sneaks up on him in the powder keg room. And Blackbeard outs himself in return about his plans, and it was almost it was almost like a step four, or step five of an AA meeting. I can't remember which step it is, where they you know <laughs> make amends with everybody you've wronged, and they were just you know uh, telling the truth to everybody. I expected to go, "Hi, my name's Low." Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Ahoy, Low. <laughs> <laughs> So it was it was real interesting and and to finally see Lo and Blackbeard duke it out and just go to town on each other was pretty interesting too. Oh, absolutely. I mean, especially in this episode because so much goes on in this episode. There are almost like four or five different turning points in the whole series. And you've kind of been waiting for that Lo Blackbeard interaction to kind of really break down. And the fact that they did it in this episode on top of everything else that had already happened I thought it was just absolutely brilliant because with Low and Blackbeard, you knew this was coming. And this is a very tricky turning point as far as uh, writing goes in a series. But it, they, they made it make sense, which right. is brilliant. Because when Low's breaking it all down, you think, like, all right, this, now the the – the dichotomy between the two of them is totally going to break down. The fact that they turned it back around so quickly that it made sense that they would still be friends. And like, even after that brutal beat down, like, all right, yeah, go carve my hole, <laughs> go carve a <laughs> hole in my skull. <laughs> and they did it in a way that made sense, which I thought was just brilliant. Right. Yeah. I, uh, I couldn't believe when he, when he turns to, uh, um, uh, Ryder, Charlie, uh, Charlie, Ryder. yeah, Charlie Ryder, and Netta, and he goes, "Well, you yeah. two have lied to me too, and I still trust you more than anybody in the world." I was like, "Wow, that's that's uh, that's some loyalty uh, from captain to crew, right there." You know? Yeah. Again, I I, I cannot emphasize the uh, the brilliance of the writing of that episode, uh, especially at that turning point, uh, because I think in a lot of other TV series in the hands of a lot of other creators, it would have came off poorly and half-assed. And that moment absolutely made sense. Right. Especially referencing uh, the opening scene where, there, where Ryder and, uh, is seeing the green light from the ocean oh, yeah. at sunrise. The way they turned it all the way back around at the end of the episode to referencing uh, them being loyal. Yeah. I That's just a tip of the hat to great writing. Yeah, I agree. I, it was it was really handled very well. And and to the point where because when they started into that, I thought, eh, where are they go? There's no way they come back from that. And then I was like, oh, oh, all right. I guess that's the way you come back from that. And I was like, wow, oh, wow. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, like especially when he pulls the gun, when Lowell pulls a gun on him and you think the kidnapping's going down and then they eventually fight, you don't think they're going to get back to the basis of, well, yeah, but I still like him and trust him so we can go on with the series. I can't even make up with my girlfriend that fast. <laughs> yeah, I know. They did it in 
like six minutes and it was fantastic. <laughs> I mean, I was like, Blackbeard apparently does not hold a grudge that long. My girlfriend, she holds a grudge <laughs> way longer than a pirate. <laughs> Moral of the story, never cheat on Blackbeard. That's right. Uh, that's right. Now, here's a question I've got for you. I don't I could not figure this out. Why is Blackbeard's uh, left eye red for the whole episode? It looks like a like a healing black eye, but I can't figure out why because it's before the fight. I thought that uh, there was an unedited scene where uh, Lowell and uh, Blackbeard get high, <laughs> and that would explain some sort of red eye and like maybe even Fletch. Like Fletch is have a scene where he has some fun. He was, he's always seems so stressed out and put in the most difficult situations. He should have a moment where he like gets drunk and. It's like, for God's sakes, there's nothing but whores on that island. Could someone get Fletch a whore? <laughs> for God's sakes. <laughs> he really does seem to need it. He does. He, he looks stressed out. Even the, there's a, even his cleft chin seems to have a uh, beat of sweat. Like, can a kid get something? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> So I and I think I think the 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 cool I mean uh, all the way through this is a cool episode and then they drill into his skull and I'm like how that that's the topper that had to be the topper of this episode where he just I mean because he's so vulnerable at that point where you're just like you're seeing a man getting his skull drilled open that was just amazing I was stunned by how much detail was in that yeah (laughs) weren't you I mean especially when they're like okay his skull's drilled in throw in a coin <laughs> right it's <laughs> kind of what it seemed like well you know he'll never be short of change for a payphone <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i the, the what do you mean long distance oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah the i the just the i mean the special effects the way they did it the blood dripping in his eyes the whole thing i was like wow that is just that is, it was uncomfortable to watch because you're just like, oh, oh I, dude. Oh, absolutely. Not only with the blood dripping down, but also when, even before he does the drilling, when he puts the uh, stick in his mouth to kind of bite down, you're yeah. like, oh my God, something bad is about to happen. <laughs> right. I'm not prepared for it. And also, I, I got this tip of the hat, a uh, great bit of acting from John Malkovich in that scene. He's brilliant in the whole series, but... In that particular scene, you were, I, I got to believe you were, like I, when I was watching it, you were cringing. You were unbloody comfortable. Oh, yeah. Even if it's just him biting down on a stick and blood dripping down, you you fell for him and, uh, oh. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, I mean, especially when, uh. Because I mean, when with acting, and I'm 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 not an actor, uh, uh, except for I can kind of do it. But I mean, you when you have to act something that you've never even remotely experienced, like you need to act like there's a guy drilling a hole in your head. I would have no idea how to go about that. I would just be like, "Ow, that hurts." <laughs> <laughs> And I gotta be honest, you probably wouldn't get the part. I uh... <laughs> probably would not. No, they'd be like, "Thank you, we'll we'll call you." <laughs> Ow, there's a quarter hole in my head. Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, especially too when you see, uh, as you're watching the episode, they pull out the bit of the skull uh-huh. and then replace it with what well, like looks like a pirate quarter. Yeah, I mean, it's so the detail in that particular scene was so uh, remarkable and. It just you feel for it. again with the bite down the stick and the blood dripping down, but it almost when the quarter that like or the pirate coin goes in his head, you almost feel more of that pain. Yeah. Than when the actual drilling is going on. Yeah, yeah, it was super, super intense, and I thought it was I mean that had, that was a great way to cap off that episode, and I almost thought they should have um, should have tapered it off there, and then they but they go back to uh, Antoinette at the end. And uh, and she's, you know, rocking the invisible baby. And I was like, all right, well, there's a good cliffhanger for next time. Uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, I, I did enjoy the actual end of the episode, especially with Antoinette kind of rocking the invisible baby, as you said. But I'm, I am also very curious with like three episodes I think they have left. Are they going to be able to tie this all together, especially under the assumption? 
I obviously I hope they pick it up for another year. Uh huh. But if it is this last, it, this is just three more episodes, and that's all we get. Can they tie it all together? Um, this is me just sort of crossing my fingers at this point. Yeah, and and uh, even more than that, can are they going to maintain that? energy and momentum for the last four episodes of this run like they did on this one or is it going to slow back down and then they pick it up like in the last two or something well again i i really hope that they sort of just play balls to the wall because maybe in their heads or who knows how it's going to play out but i really hope they just Again, I hope they get picked up for another season, but I would love the idea if they just say, like, hey, we got three more episodes left. We're not getting picked up. Let's just throw it all out there and just be uh, played to the max. Right, yeah. I think I think that would be a great way to do it, too. All right, so we are, uh, we are good ways into this, so we should probably jump over to that interview and then uh, close up shop here. This is going to be our longest episode ever. Uh, so we have a special treat for all of you listening. Uh, we did an interview with Ezra Buzzington, who plays Oswald Eisengrim. The uh, you would recognize him as the bald, large-eared pirate uh, hanging around on the show, who's about to uh, come into things in a much larger way. And so we uh, we sat down and talked with Ezra, and uh, it had, we had some technical difficulties, and it will sound a little bit different because Tony was in the same room as me instead of uh, from afar. So, uh, but it's a really great interview. We get some killer insights into the show, and uh, and some killer insights into Ezra too. He's a super interesting guy. So uh, here we go. Okay, so we are here uh, on the Blackbeard uh, Being Blackbeard podcast with Ezra Buzzington, who plays Oswald well, Eisengrim on the show Crossbones. Welcome to the show, Ezra. Thanks a lot. I'm I'm happy to be here because, as I said, you guys make me laugh. Well, we try. It's, uh, we, we have no idea what we're doing on any of this. Um, neither oh, one of us. Shows. That, that totally shows. <laughs> yeah, it, I'm... It, it, it's quite clear <laughs> that you pretty much have no idea what you're talking about. Yes, but that's no. That's what makes it funny. Yeah, good. Yes. Well, we have no. We've never done a podcast before this, and uh, we're not even used to being on this end of an interview. So yeah. it'll uh, it'll be interesting <laughs> to find out what happens here. Yeah, low expectations are our strength. Yeah, <laughs> and versatility is something that can serve us all. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. That's right. So uh, for for our listeners who are not sure who Ezra is, he has been in a ton of things, lots of TV, uh, The Middle, Bones, Criminal Minds, Justified, Weeds, uh, movies like The Artist, The Prestige, The Hills Have Eyes, Fight Club, and my personal favorite, me, myself, and Irene. Uh, oh, is that right? Is that your favorite? It's one of my favorites, because years ago I actually wrote a song based on a line in that film that started my comedy career. So uh, I have, oh, that's hilarious. I have uh, you almost to thank for that. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, I got to tell you that that movie is totally underrated. I mean, it, they they got kind of screwed, I think, by that release because everybody was out to get them. It seemed at the point uh, at that point, and uh, it's a shame because it didn't do particularly well in the theaters. But it was funny. It was a funny film. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, uh, yeah, uh, that was the start of my career. So <laughs> maybe I have Jim Carrey to blame rather than thank for, for what I'm doing now. Circle of life. Or maybe film. the audience has Jim Carrey to blame. That's <laughs> right. To thank, they had to blame. Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, so on the show, are you? Have you guys filmed all ten episodes already, or is that still going we on? Did. We We were uh, we were lucky enough to spend about six months down in Fajardo and Ceiba, Puerto Rico. Nice. Um, shooting all ten episodes. It was a straight to order ten episode. Boom! Just go and do them all, and see what you end up with, and then go home. Very cool. And that's exactly what we did. It was great. We were there from roughly mid October to mid March. Well, that's the time to be in Puerto Rico. At least that's uh, is cooler than than doing it in the middle of summer. I would imagine. From what I understand, that's very true. I was I was talking to somebody the other day at a restaurant, and they said, "Be glad you're not there now because it's just so incredibly hot." But I got to tell you, even if it's, it, it's incredibly hot, when the, the breeze kicks up, and I mean, come on, it's the Caribbean. How fucking bad can that be? And <laughs> it's, just, just, it's absolutely gorgeous. And the people were great. It was just uh, uh, quite a feather in the cap for my career. I was very happy to have been there. And That's how great. Ex- and how excited were you when you got the call? It's like, hey, do you want to come to Puerto Rico and play pirate? I mean, that just sounds like a dream come true. <laughs> Seriously, right? I was. It's funny. Uh, I was actually leaving the gym at that point, and uh, I had, my phone rang, and I picked up. It was my agent. And he goes, "What are you doing for the next six months?" I said, "Looking for work." What the hell are you doing for the next six months? He goes, "Well, they want you in Puerto Rico." And I said, "When?" And it's like Tuesday, and this was like Thursday. Oh my <laughs> so gosh! Like, um, 
Bye. <laughs> I'm gone. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm packing a six-month overnight bag, and I'm heading on down. And I went down and barely looked back. It was uh, absolutely great. It was, it was just an incredible experience. And uh, it, Also, you never know, of course, when, when uh, uh, you do, especially television, well, film as well, but especially TV, it seems, you never know what the dynamic is going to be. Will everybody get along? Will it be a problem shoot? Will it be an easy shoot? Will um, we ha- How hard will we have to work? You know, all sorts of questions that nobody ever has the answer to until you actually start rolling. And Luckily enough, uh, and I'm not blowing any smoke here, I have no reason to do that. Everybody on this shoot, it was just incredible, was, I don't know if they were just, everybody was happy to be there or just happy <laughs> to be working, but it, it really was a blessing on pretty much every um, uh, account. It seriously was. The first couple of weeks were rough uh, because everybody was just getting to know each other. We're starting to work together and you have half a Puerto Rican crew and half a Puerto Rican, oh, well, all of the background were, were Puerto Rican locals mm-hmm. and their language barriers. But once that was overcome, it was just amazing to, to watch everybody work together so beautifully. And again, it was, it really was a blessing. That's great. What was the uh, audition process like? I didn't have to audition for this part. This was a straight to order. Oh, so they just uh, brought straight, you in uh, straight to offer. Yeah, they brought me in. They, they saw my reel. They knew my work. And, uh, uh David Slade, uh, knew my work. We'd worked together. Oh gosh. It's been about eight years now, I think together on a little industrial and we'd always wanted to work together again. And we tried several times, but it just couldn't work out. And uh, when this happened, uh, he passed me by Neil Cross, and, and Neil really liked what I did, and so they offered me Oswald Eisengrim. Okay. And what was even better was I was actually hired <clears throat> excuse me, for, so I think it was six out of ten episodes. And uh, Neil liked what I was doing with Oswald enough that he added me to three. Oh, okay. So that was, that was incredible. <clears throat> so it was a blessing as well. It now, was a great time. Yeah, sounds like it. Now, you worked with John Malkovich before in Art, Art School Confidential, right? I did, in fact. I worked one day with John on Art School Confidential, which his company, Mr. Mudd, produced. They also had produced Ghost World, which I was also in. Uh-huh. And, uh, but I, I hadn't met John on Ghost World. He wasn't around, as far as I know. And, um, yeah, it was, it was an awkward meeting because I was completely naked. Right. Um, <laughs> because my character is like the nude artist uh, uh, model. <laughs> In, in the art class, and I'm just walking around with my big old dick just hanging around. <laughs> <laughs> How do you do? My name is Ezra Buzzard. And we didn't, we didn't talk a lot. <laughs> first, first day, nobody knew where to look. Yeah, it right. Funny. I'm sure that everybody looked you in the <laughs> eye that night. day. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know. Depending on what you're saying, um, <laughs> no matter how many times I waved it in particular people's faces, they always look away. I don't know what the story was there, but yeah, I didn't get to know John on that shoot, uh, obviously. And honestly, I was a little nervous to uh, to meet him. Um, but oh my God, he, he's uh, I, I, words just really don't describe um, for me at any rate what a uh, fucking genius this guy is. I mean, he's he's so freaking smart and so brilliantly talented and so giving as an actor very often, especially with some names, you'll be given very little um, from them when it's your turn to shoot. But John was consistently there for absolutely everybody. And I think probably because his brilliant Chicago training, I'm a great fan of Chicago. I'm a Midwesterner. And I think Chicago actors are the best in the country. And, the way he was trained, he just knows that, that if he's there to give the other actor uh, what it is the other actor needs, then the entire piece will be better. And so he views it as his job, and, and uh, it's just uh, we were all very lucky to have him. That's great. Is, is he as intense as his characters generally are? He's incredibly intense. He's very quiet off camera um, with everyone um, that I saw at any rate. I don't know his personal life, but on set. He's very quiet, and I would always approach with a little trepidation. <laughs> you know, but he was also he was also incredibly open. <clears throat> Excuse me. He was just being himself and kind of zenning out the entire experience. And um, to to be with him was an honor. It truly was. Um, and to have any conversation with him at all, when we had several, it was it was just I don't know. It was, it was one of the most unusual experiences of my life. Um, my my uh, I have so much admiration for him that words honestly just can't describe it. Uh, and I yeah. kid you not. I, I, I don't blow smoke. I really don't. If I didn't like somebody, I wouldn't necessarily say it, but I certainly wouldn't <laughs> sing their praises. And, and he, he, uh, 
he is well worthy of, of any praises sung in his direction. So we'll assume that anybody you don't mention you hate then. It's, that's how that that's works. exactly right. Yeah, all right. I so, think that's a really good idea. You haven't mentioned Tom Cruise even once, so... <laughs> I've, I've actually been lucky enough not to have met Shorty yet, so I look forward to today that that will happen, and now it probably never will, because I'm sure he's a huge fan of this podcast. I'm, I'm sure he's yeah. listened to all six episodes so far, yes, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm still getting Scientology emails, so I got family here is listening. <laughs> Be careful what you wish for, dude. They're knocking on your door. So your uh, your character is is. St- Did I lose I think- you? No, I think we're. I lost it. Oh, can you hear me now? I have silence on my end. Are we back yet? How Anything? about now? I'm if you can hear me, I can hear you. We can hear you. How is the window to our disc? <laughs> Are we there? Oh no! Damn it! May glorious summer by the son of York. Powered <laughs> <laughs> on his house. <laughs> what happened there? Did I push a button? Did you push a button? Oh, I, sometimes Skype just does that. It just drops out of nowhere. That's all right. I, can, uh, I, I oh, bet. That was very true in Puerto Rico, by the way. That was awful. That was a pain in the ass. Every time I would Skype from our incredibly beautiful four star resort in Fajardo, the Skype would last like five minutes and then the internet shuts out. Of it's course. Like, it was crazy. Yeah. Oh, it was terrible, terrible first word problems we had. <laughs> terrible, terrible. I, I was terrified for a moment because I bad mouthed Scientology and all of a sudden the power okay. went down and I said, oh, I was. Oh, man, you're yeah. gone again, dude. Oh, oh are we gone again? Uh. I'm just going to hang up and try again. Yeah, there it goes. Jesus hates me. <laughs> no, it's it's Scientology. We're not going to talk about them anymore. <laughs> you shouldn't have said, oh, God, that now I'm really creeped out. Yeah, I know. Just so you know. <laughs> like, really, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sleep with one eye open. Tonight. There are people on our way to our houses right now for all of us. Get out of the house. Get out of the house now. <laughs> You know what? You laugh, but where do you live? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm staying off the grid Dude, are now. You guys, are you guys like? Are you in the Bay? You're in San Francisco. Yeah, San Jose right now. Yes, and you're fine. I'm in fucking LA. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, <laughs> I'm screwed. So how else can I answer anything about crossbones for you without any spoilers, of course? Yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah. So I mean, now you're. Uh, looks. I, we were actually recording this interview. As episode six is airing, um, so we don't we we don't even know what's going on in it yet because uh, we, we haven't watched it yet. Uh, but it looks like your character is going to start to take a little bit bigger role over the next few episodes. Yeah, um, that is true. Uh, he does. It uh, they they saved the best till last. There you so- go. <laughs> there you go. Uh- it, Honestly, hand to God, I don't know how much um, Neil had written of the the Bible before um, we started shooting. I really don't know. I know that he was writing a lot while uh, we were all there, and so things uh, would affect the trajectory of characters as we went. And so I, I, I don't know if this was always the plan or what, but uh, more happens with with Eisengrim. Now, I have an incredibly huge backstory that absolutely nobody knows about but me, and this isn't really indicated much on the screen, (laughs) that it was still, you know, every actor has to do that. Sure, yeah. uh, So you have history, and it's like the the thing I was telling everyone, including Neil, was that my character, Oswald Eisengrim, was committed to three things and three things only, and not necessarily in this order. Um, They were the C, uh, his male lover at this point in time, and Blackbeard. Oh. And over the course, again, not necessarily in that order, but, but over the course of the 10 episodes, he loses pretty much close to all of them. Um, it, it, uh, it was an interesting experiment for me as an actor to watch these things disappearing from my character and affecting his identity. Oh, excuse me. And so, what? What the things that he is compelled to do later in the in the series are justified when looked at through that prism. Interesting. Um, it, wow. Yeah, it, it was a really interesting character. I, I loved Oswald very, very much. Uh, he he was misunderstood and, uh, frankly, not shot anywhere near enough. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and I don't know if you can tell us this, but what does the future of the series look like past ten episodes? I wish to holy bejesus, who I mentioned earlier, that I knew. Um, I I don't know, honestly, how network TV works in terms of them notifying, uh, uh, other than series regulars, what 
the deal is with second seasons or third seasons or anything. I don't know anything about that because I'm mostly a film dude, even though I've worked a lot of TV. <clears throat> Excuse me, as, as far as my area of expertise is really more film. I'm also a filmmaker. For TV, I mean, I don't know, maybe they could tell me again on a Thursday and I'd be flying down on a Tuesday. <laughs> I, I swear to God, I just know nothing. Any questions I've asked have been have been answered with, you know, vague, well, we'll see. Kind of answers. <laughs> yeah. So I know exactly as much as you know about what happens with the future of um, Crossbones. Okay. Uh, I, yeah. I, of course, I pray for it to go on because I love the show. I think it's it's freaking brilliant. And I don't think there are enough shows like it on um, network television. No, certainly yeah. not. Certainly not. No, no, I agree. And uh, one of the things I'm a huge fan of is the writing, especially the dialogue back and forth between the characters. I really think there's a poetry and a even Shakespearean quality about it. But it's one thing for me to take it in as a viewer. But what's it like for you to read these words on paper and then rehearse and then exchange them with the other actors in the scenes? Great question. And it's funny because I, I heard your last podcast and I, I heard you uh, referencing Shakespeare and you're right. Um, the writing is intentionally written in that kind of language, not Shakespearean specifically, but sure. a more poetic language because with the way people spoke in 17 and change um, hundreds was very different than the way we speak now. And it was far more poetical. And we'd only lost that in America starting really around the 40s and 50s, actually the 50s. Um, there was a, a more, there was liquidity to the language that, that we don't have now, which is I think probably why Neil appreciated and I uh, assume went with the actors he went with because the majority of them can handle language. And when every script I would get, when I would get the script, I would read it and I'd be stunned and amazed at how, well, first of all, how Richard Coyle and John Malkovich could memorize all of this with this <laughs> and be so, uh, so on point and ready. It was so freaking impressive. Um, the, the, sometimes if I had even just five words, I knew for a fact that Neil had labored over those very words. And I'm a writer as well, so I, I get that. I get the rhythm. I get the, the, the alliteration. I get mm -hmm. the choice of one word over the other. And there's a, a, a very specific approach you have to take. And some, it's funny, with, with really, really, really good writing, Becca is a good example of this, with, I found with really good writing, the lines come almost automatically. They just come out. When I audition or I read for various, um, let's say, lesser... Um, invested uh, shows, television shows, it's very difficult sometimes to remember the words they've chosen uh, for us to speak because, frankly, they don't just flow naturally. They're kind of bumpy or they're clunky or they're what the hell ever they are, and it's just not good writing. But with Neil, especially with Neil, um, there was this, as I said, liquidity to the language. When I was working on some of my later uh, uh, dialogue, I, I would have my recorder uh, playing my iPod playing in my ears and uh, as I'm working out at the gym or as I'm lying by the pool <laughs> working so hard <laughs> in Fajardo, Puerto Rico as I'm working on my tent um, <laughs> hearing the rhythms and finding the rhythms and, and within that then finding Eisengrin's rhythm specifically which is different than John's or different than Lowe's or different than um, uh, any of the other characters certainly um, uh, uh, Peter's it, I don't know, it's a great question, and you're right that it's poetical, and it's intentionally poetical. And that's one of the things that worries me, that it won't do well on network, frankly. <laughs> because, uh, really, I mean, because no, this no, isn't England. Very honest. Yeah, this no, isn't that... England. This is America, and we're used to the Kardashians, for fuck's sake. Right, yeah. yeah. I even find myself, I gotta, I mean, I, I DVR the show, and I find I've gotta rewind a couple of times to go, what was, what was that? Did... Oh, he you said. Have no idea how many times I had to reread lines just to make sure I didn't <laughs> what the hell I was supposed to be saying. <laughs> but he didn't compromise, and I think that's great. You know, as opposed to to other pirate shows that might be on the air now, I think that that deal did not compromise in the language at all. And I think I think people are getting a little more used to that idea with Game of Thrones and a lot of the right. HBO shows and things like that. So I, I don't think it's as far a stretch as it used to be. Well, it's interesting, West Wing actually ran into that problem as well in their first couple of seasons because it was so fast and so clipped, and, and, and uh, I assume House of Cards might even have this a little bit as well. But that's, you know, a download, so it's a lot easier for people who already love the show and can follow it and are of that level can, can follow it. But with West Wing, they had trouble with people following it 
certainly the first season, simply because of the pace, if nothing, and the amount of information. With Neil, you're getting both. Well, actually, you're getting three. You're getting pace, bang, 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 very, very quick for the most part. You're getting poetical language, and you're getting content in a language you're not familiar with. Right, right. So it, it, it's very challenging. And NBC should really be lauded for... for Shit. Ow, damn it. <laughs> so good. <laughs> and welcome back to the Eyes and Ears show. <laughs> <laughs> NBC we got a caller. Should, <laughs> NBC should really be lauded for... <laughs> for, for taking it, we got a call for taking the uh, the risk. You know, I don't know if it'll pay off or not. I mean, the ratings were certainly better this week. I've been told um, the the share went up like fifty percent, so that's a good thing. Oh, but, that's a great thing. Yeah, who the hell knows? I mean, I can't read that stuff. I really can't. You know, I mean, the the first episode I saw had almost like five million people. I thought, Jesus Christ, I've been doing theater for decades, <laughs> and now, now more people have seen me barely do anything than who saw me play Hamlet. <laughs> which is like you know kind of sucks in a way but you know what can you do it is what it is now i want to i actually want to ask you about the theater stuff but before that we have to hear the midget trollop story that you promised oh my god you i cannot believe what i was listening it's funny because a friend of mine turned me on to the, this podcast when i was driving to vegas uh -huh. so i got to listen to all pretty much of the episodes except the most recent one as i was driving to vegas <laughs> and i was banging the steering wheel twice once when you were you constantly referring to claire um um kate balfour uh -huh. as the quartermaster's wife. Right. She, she is the quartermaster. Oh, see? We're getting, She's uh, the one. We're getting schooled. All right. Seriously, dude. And I'm sitting there going, is that like, that's like totally unintentionally sexist. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it was totally, you know, intentionally sexist. I don't know. But yeah, she's, she's the one. She's, she's, she's got the cock there. She's the top. <laughs> um, <laughs> so there's that. And the other thing you kept talking about, Mrs. Frost, I'm like, oh my God, dude, open your eyes. I don't know much how screen how much screen time she got. <laughs> but um, we have a midget trollop. I love her to death. And Carla Michelle is her name. <laughs> and if you actually go to my Facebook, you can find her. It's with Carla with a K. Carla Michelle. And she's gorgeous. And she's just itty bitty. She's an itty bit. She's a tiny little thing. And she's a, a trollop. And she's a local Puerto Rican actress. And uh, they, they used her in the background quite a lot. Actually, in fact, uh, I just posted, uh, my guy just posted a uh, thing on my fan page, Facebook fan page thing today, that had her in the picture. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but yeah, so not only should there be a midget <laughs> trot, there is a midget trot. And she's blonde, which is, which is rare as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, now I have to go see the picture on your Facebook page for sure. That you is, really, really do. That is fantastic. And just look her up. Just, just, just look her up on Facebook. It's Carla with a K, Michelle. And I would push her. I, I got to tell you, the background actors on this show, they're all buddies of mine now. They were great. First of all, they're experienced, wonderful, uh, primarily union actors. And they were just great guys and women. So they were using union background actors the whole time? Actually, no. I, I, I meant equity when I said union, not oh, necessarily okay. SAG. I don't think they were using SAG after background, actually. Oh, okay. But uh, they were uh, equity, okay. a number of them. So, yeah, yeah let's, let's talk theater a little bit because, I mean, I, I was looking over your information today, and you seem to have a pretty considerable theater background. Tell me about that. Oh, yeah. Um, well, it doesn't pay. There's <laughs> one thing I can tell you is that's why the hell do you think I'm in movies and TV? Um, I did theater for a long freaking time. Um, I'm called uh, in the States, I'm known as the Godfather of the Fringe movement. Uh -huh. Fringe being defined as uh, fringe theater, any working company uh, that has a season with an operating budget of $100,000 or less a year, uh -huh. a season. Um, so. Shit. I hate you, Skype. I really do. I swear to fuck, this, this, this interview is, like, hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> it, it really is. <laughs> so quickly, before we lose touch again, um, started the, the first Fringe Theater Festival in the United States, which was in Seattle. I started that about 10,000 years ago, and then I assisted, uh, starting with two other co-founders, the New York International Fringe Festival, which is the largest fringe theater festival in the United States. And now I advise on the Hollywood Fringe Festival, which has been going for five years. And uh, so my background in theater, I grew up on the boards. My mom was an actress, and so I started at the age of nine, uh, gracing the stage with 
whatever the hell it is I bring to this thing. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, did theater our entire lives, and that's kind of what I did, until I decided that I didn't want to starve anymore, and I needed to make some kind of money, and then I moved to L.A. <laughs> so, uh, so Seattle was the first one in the U.S. then? Uh, yes, it was. Oh, okay. Seattle uh, was the first fringe festival in the United States. The very first in the world was at Edinburgh. Right. Mm -hmm. um, in the 40s, just after the war. Yeah. Have you done and, Edinburgh? Uh, no, I've not, actually. And a number of my friends have. In fact, I have a friend leaving, I think, tomorrow or the next day to take a show there called Hot Cat, which is a deconstruction movement piece uh, based on Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Oh, It started here at a local fringe theater. Edinburgh is a crazy place in August. It's it's I did it in two thousand five and it's absolutely insane. There's a lot of stand up there, right? Ton of stand up, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I mean that's where Craig Ferguson was found too. He started at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Yeah, yeah. Eddie Izzard, Craig Ferguson, a lot of those guys. Yeah, Eddie Izzard, Edinburgh. that's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot about Eddie. In fact, when we were starting the New York Fringe, I happened to catch Eddie Izzard doing a show at it wasn't La Mama, it was PS one twenty two, I think. And I sent a note backstage saying, hey, we're going to start a New York Fringe Festival. Are you interested? And so one of his people called and said, no, we're not. Uh. <laughs> so, well, well, neither am I then, Eddie. Up yours. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's hilarious. He totally makes me laugh. Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. He's, he's one of my idols. Yeah, he really is. He's hilariously funny. Well, great. Um, so yeah, that's that's that theater background. But I I feel like I'm taking up your entire podcast here. Oh no, not at all. We're actually going to do the regular podcast on Sunday. We're just going to do an extra long episode this time. So it's it's uh, absolutely all good for sure. So this will be a treat for all of our uh, dozens of listeners. Um, <laughs> we're actually up to, we're up to dozens now. Yeah. So I'm happy about that. We can say dozens with an S. We're yes. very proud. <laughs> Very impressive. It's like my Facebook following. Hey, there you go. There you go. Well, Ezra, man, we really appreciate you doing this. I think I think everybody's going to really like it a lot. Yeah, thank oh, you so, so much. This is great. I appreciate what you guys are doing, and I I really hope you last through the rest of the episodes. <laughs> and uh, God God willing, on into season two. Amen, brother. All Absolutely. right, you got it. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you soon. Take it easy, guys. All right, bye bye. bye. And that was our interview with. Uh, Ezra Buzzington, we hope you guys enjoyed that, and uh, he's a he, we we had a great time doing it. We thought he was a very very cool guy, very nice to come on the show with us. Oh yeah, it could not have been nicer and cooler, and also I uh, just had some absolutely uh, fascinating insight not only into the show but into the LA theater scene. Uh, Ezra Buzzington, uh, on behalf of Phil and I, much thanks to you for doing all of this because you were absolutely wonderful. And also, thank you for following me on Twitter, and I've been doing the same. Uh, but <laughs> he, he he could not have been cooler and more amazing, and uh, I just had an absolute blast talking to him. Yeah, so much fun, so much fun. All right, well, let's close this up. Uh, what do you got? Uh, where are you going to – let's do some plugs, Tony. Where are you going to be over the next week or two? Uh, Friday, I will be at Vito's Pub in Dublin, California, and Saturday, I will be in the Comedy Highway in Oakland, California. Oh, nice. And on July 29th, I will be at the uh, San Francisco Punchline recording my CD. Uh, please follow me on Twitter, at Tony Dianco, T-O-N-Y-D-I-J-A-M-C-O, for show information, and I appreciate you all coming out. Fantastic. Uh, let's see. Uh, this Tuesday, July 22nd, I will be headlining a show at Agave Restaurant in San Jose. And uh, the 23rd, I, I have tickets to go see Motley Crue, so I will just be out banging my head that night. And then uh, <laughs> July 30th. Nice. nice. Yes, $10 lawn seats. Got to love it. And then July 31st through August 2nd, I will be headlining the week at Mark Ridley's Comedy Castle in uh, Royal Oak, Michigan, just outside of Detroit. So that will be loads of fun. And on the 29th, I'm going to be watching Tony record his CD at the Punchline. So all good there. <laughs> all right. So this has been, uh, we had fun with this episode and the interview and all that great. Thank you very much for uh, hanging out with us and supporting the show and listening and downloading and telling your friends and leaving us reviews and all that kind of great stuff. If you are enjoying the show and would like to continue to hear more, please do leave us one of those nice five-star written reviews over at iTunes like you've been doing. And uh, you can also find us on Stitcher, on the uh, Stitcher app, and you can leave us reviews there too. And we super appreciate it. You guys are the ones that keep the show going. And uh, without you, we're just talking to ourselves, which sucks. So uh, you can visit us. Oh, and you can find me at philjohnsoncomedy.com. I almost forgot to plug that. And you can find more about the show uh, at beingblackbeard.com, including 
including our character reference sheet. If you are confused about who's who on the show, come by and check out the character reference sheet and anything about uh, the host of the show and listen and downloads and all that kind of thing. Uh, good stuff. And thank you. This is the Being Blackbeard Podcast. We'll see you next week. Bye. You've been listening to the Being Blackbeard Podcast. Visit us at beingblackbeard.com and be sure to subscribe and give us a five-star review on iTunes. Arrgh!